the Fermi Paradox. Part 3 SETI Foundations and Fascinations From the start, SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, has danced a balletic line between hard fact and wild speculation, and between scientific hypothesis and science fiction. Never giving in to the untestable, but to date, never locating the evidence to test its grand hypothesis. There are a number of misconceptions about SETI. For instance, it is not an organization. While many organizations devoted to SETI do exist, such as the SETI Institute and the SETI League, the term SETI itself does not denote an establishment or think tank, but rather an activity, one undertaken at first on an ad hoc basis by several disparate groups and institutions. Another misconception is that it is NASA-funded. While NASA did run a SETI program from 1975 to 1993, for most of its existence, SETI has been almost entirely funded either by private donations or by universities. Perhaps the most pervasive misconception about SETI, however, is that it is not science. SETI's hypothesis, that there exist extraterrestrial intelligences with whom we are capable of communicating via radio, may be outlandish, perhaps even naive, but it is compatible with the laws of physics and, more importantly, testable. We may never prove SETI's hypothesis true, but there may come a time, perhaps a century from now, when our telescopes have reached such a level of precision and our surveys such a level of exhaustion that we could say with a high degree of certainty that it is false, in much the same way that, thanks to decades of scanning, we are now certain that we are not currently threatened by any extinction-level asteroids. The search for extraterrestrial civilizations has persisted for as long as people have believed that such civilizations may exist. In the 1890s, the eccentric Bostonian Percival Lowell searched for monuments and vast construction projects on Mars, which he claimed he could see through his telescope. While these were later shown to be optical illusions, they did inspire H.G. Wells to write The War of the Worlds. In 1899, the even more eccentric inventor and physicist Nikola Tesla mistook disturbances in Jupiter's magnetic field for radio contact with aliens. But the day one of SETI in the modern sense was the 19th of September, 1959, which saw the publication of a paper by two astronomers at Cornell University titled Searching for Interstellar Communications. The paper would spur Otto Struve, Frank Drake's superior, into greenlighting Project Ozma, the first ever SETI search, and establish what would become SETI's core principles, at least initially. In the paper, the authors, Giuseppe Caccioni and Philip Morrison, assumed that, quote, long ago, aliens established a channel of communication that would one day become known to us, and they look forward patiently to the answering signals from the sun that would make known to them that a new society has entered the community of intelligence. They concluded that electromagnetic radiation, the same spectrum we use to transmit radio and wireless internet, was the only convenient way to transmit such communication, and that anyone hoping to contact us would deliberately select a channel that would be easily found using our detectors, and not obscured either by the wash of radio noise in space or by our own atmosphere. Caccioni and Morrison were also the first to declare the microwave region of the spectrum, and particularly the 21 centimeter wavelength of hydrogen, to be the most likely frequency on which to send the galactic message, both because it would be a frequency well known to everyone in the universe, and because it would be one of the first frequencies searched for by nascent radio astronomers. The space between the frequencies of hydrogen and hydroxyl is relatively quiet, and so anyone transmitting between them would be very easily heard. It also lies within our, quote, atmospheric window, and thus could be detected by ground-based telescopes. Because hydrogen and hydroxyl are the components of water, this region of the spectrum is known as the, quote, water hole, and would become the favorite frequency of 90% of targeted SETI searches prior to the introduction of broad-spectrum searches in the 1990s. The paper concluded with a now classic line that has effectively become SETI's credo, quote, The probability of success is difficult to estimate, but if we never search, the chance of success is zero. Whatever one's opinions of SETI's achievements after nearly 60 years of searching, it's hard to argue that statement is not still true. During the 1960s, the Soviet Union conducted several SETI searches, mostly under the direction of Nikolai Kardashev, about whom there will be more to say in a later chapter. 
1971, NASA commissioned what might be considered a follow-up report to the Caccini-Morrison paper called Project Cyclops. It affirmed that the most likely bandwidth to search would be the microwave region, specifically the wave band between hydrogen and hydroxyl. It also argued for the eventual construction of an array of radio telescopes, beginning with only a few but expanding after 15 years to hundreds of kilometers across at an estimated cost of $10 billion, or nearly $60 billion today. Needless to say, the project was never commissioned, but it did inspire Dr. Robert S. Dixon of Ohio State University to harness its unused radio telescope, nicknamed Big Ear, to conduct the first full-time SETI program. The project began in 1973, monitoring the now familiar region by the hydrogen line. By 1975, with the addition of some then-powerful computing, the project was able to monitor 50 channels simultaneously. And then, on August 15, 1977, the Ohio State SETI project entered modern legend. On that day, a volunteer named Jerry Eamon recorded a signal that exactly matched the antenna pattern, meaning that it must have come from at least as far as the moon. The signal was strong, over 30 times louder than the baseline of space, and fell close to the hydrogen line, exactly what SETI astronomers had predicted. The signal lasted for exactly 72 seconds, or as long as the telescope could detect it before Earth's rotation moved it out of line. Eamon was so astonished by what he found that he scrawled the word WOW in the margin of the computer printout, thus giving it its name, the WOW signal. To this day, the WOW signal remains the closest our race has to evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence. And yet, in all the years since, and despite multiple attempts, no one has ever managed to relocate it. Without confirmation, it remains a tantalizing phantom on the outer edge of human inquiry. Dixon himself later concluded that its most likely origin was a military satellite transmitting covertly on an illegal frequency, though he doubted we would ever know for certain. Where SETI would go after the WOW signal is the subject of the next episode. <laughs>